We got to spend some time with our kids and grandkids yesterday, uh, other than our youngest son, Noah, who uh, couldn't be with us to help us do the yard work at Josh's house. He, he was busy in Utah skiing, so he, he couldn't really be bothered with the yard work. But uh, <laughs> we, were over at, we were over at our son and daughter-in-law, Josh and Kara's, and we were doing some work, and, and uh, we, I, we just love spending time with them. We love spending time with our grandkids. And one of my favorite things about being with my grandkids is how they never grow tired of certain things. And I, I have a book that Charlene bought for me a few years ago. The book is called, titled Hey Grand Dude. And it's written by Paul McCartney, who would say Grand Dude, right? He calls the children chillers. Um, but it's a fantastic book. But I bring it with me whenever I go see them or when they come to, to the house. And I probably read this book to our oldest granddaughter, Vida, a couple hundred times. It has to be. Um, and in each sitting, I can probably read it to them four, five, six times. And I know that, that, that they want me to read it again because when I read it to them and I get to the end, do you know what they say? Again, again, Papa, read it again, Papa. And so I, I mean, I'll read that book until, well, I usually read it until I fall asleep. <laughs> and I'll fall asleep and then Vita will do this on my... But I think about this this word from G.K. Chesterton when I, when I think about what that feels like and looks like. One of my favorite quotes from Chesterton from the book Orthodoxy. He says, Because children have abounding, vit- have abounding vitality, because they are in spirit fierce and free, therefore they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, Do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he's nearly dead. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exult in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be that God makes every daisy separate. It, It may be that God makes... Sorry, it may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never got tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy, for we have sinned and grown old, and our father is younger than we. I love that picture that God is intensely intentional about each act of creation, and that monotony does not get old with God. And I was thinking that about this week because it's in the routine and in the mundane that we grow. It's in the things that we do over and over again. In Chesterton's words, the monotony, it's the regular rhythms that we're we're going to find growth in. God is highly dedicated to process. You think about the way the world works. And it's about process. I've heard Phil say this so many times. If Jesus only had to come and die on the cross, he could have done it in a long weekend. But that's not how God steps into the world. Jesus empties himself, becomes like us, is born like us, is swaddled like us when we're born, grows up as a child into, and through adolescence and into adulthood and lives multiple years in adulthood, in a trade before he enters his ministry and spends three years in ministry and then the cross and then the resurrection and then the ascension. God is highly dedicated to process. And it can be said about spiritual formation or spiritual transformation that we have to do the work of it. Remember that Grace is opposed to earning, but it's not opposed to effort. We do the work of transformation, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we do the work. Others have said that spiritual formation or spiritual transformation is the slow train that stops at all the stops. If you've traveled in Europe, you know what that means, right? That you can get the train directly from London to Oxford. You just, it's a straight train. It's going to get you there in pretty good time. Or you take the milk run, and it stops at all the stops. It just depends on how long you want to be on the train. Well, spiritual transformation 
is the slow train that stops at all the stops. And to live a vibrant, winsome, and non-anxious life in the midst of this troubled world means we have to live in the power of the resurrection, not in our own power. Like it's not mostly about the will to do things. It's about the process to get there. We want to live in the power of the Spirit. And that takes routine and consistency of coming back and coming back and coming back to God. At the men's retreat last week, Phil asked me this question uh, in, to, with the group. He said, talk a little bit about your morning, you know, your morning process. And I've talked about that with you here. My morning routine is extraordinarily specific. And it's to the point that it's actually become harder for me to travel. I don't like to be away from my space. I don't like to be away from my little, you know, my little nest there in my study at my house. And, and my morning routine is you know, consistent. I, I, I go into my, my office and I sharpen my six pencils. It's about time to get new ones because the ones that are there are getting small. And I sharpen those and I put them on the little test, the de- little table beside my chair. It's about like that table. And, and I light the three candles that for me are significant to the Holy Spirit. And then I light the two candles that are significant to me as, as my journey with Jesus, that I'm not going into the day alone, but he's going with me. And, 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 and I have that picture of Christ and his friend where you know, it's that icon of, of Christ being behind Abba Minas, and they're looking down the road at where they're headed together. But it's that routine that become extremely comfortable for me. I didn't get that routine in yesterday morning. We were at Josh and Kara's, and that place gets loud quickly. And I'm, when I say quickly, I mean like 5.30, it starts moving around, you know. Josh is like, Dad, let's get up and go for a bike ride early in the morning. I'm like, No. I'm not doing that. It's a Saturday. I'm sleeping in if I can. And, but he was up making a lot of noise at 5.30, which means the kids were up at 6. And I still didn't go for a bike ride. But, <laughs> but I, you know, so I was reading Hey Grand Dude to our youngest granddaughter, Eden, at 6 a.m. Right? Because that's, that's what, so when, when we're out of our routine and out of our space, it's hard to keep that going. And I understand how important that is. And I think the challenge is that our culture thrives on variety. Think about, That's not actually normal. It's normal for our culture, but it's not normal for the world. Think about maybe the question that somebody asked you this morning or last night. Hey, what are we going to have for dinner? When was the last time you heard that? What are we going to have for dinner? Or maybe you got up this morning. Hey, what should we have for breakfast? It implies that there's a lot of options. I remember when I was in Kosovo back in just before 2000 and, and there had been that war had just finished and, um, and we were in this small village and, and we, would, we were staying above this little restaurant and, and, you know, we would go down for breakfast and <clears throat> you know what breakfast was? Eggs and rice. And then we'd go for lunch. You know what lunch was? Eggs and rice. And then we'd go for dinner. You know what dinner was? Eggs and rice and chicken because you have to eat more eggs than chickens in order to maintain that cycle, <laughs> right? <laughs> but I, it struck me for the very first time on that trip that the, the world doesn't live like we live. We, we worship variety. We don't want to eat the same thing two days in a row. And so it makes food, you know, just a different thing. We, we, but routine is the way most people in the world live. It's, it's how it works in, in, so, many, in so many ways. But this morning, I want us to think together and to practice some routines that will be very helpful in keeping our minds set on the Spirit, right? We read from Romans chapter 8 last week, and we'll return to it this week, as I hope to point you towards some really practical tools to keep setting the mind on the Spirit. Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 8, "'For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh.'" But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. And so there's a couple of questions I think might be really important to ask. And these are not rhetorical questions. But one is, and probably the first and most important question, do, do we believe that Paul is right when he says this? Like, do we actually believe that setting the mind on the flesh is going to be death and that setting the mind on the spirit is going to be life and peace? We have to to sort that out. Because if we don't believe that, first of all, then you're not going to follow that up with any any kind of behavior. 
So that's the first question that we need. Do we believe that Paul was right when he said this? Do we believe that Augustine was right when he said that God has made us for himself and that we are restless until we find our rest in him? Do we believe that true, to be true? So if we do believe it, then the second question is this. Do we want life and peace? If we believe Paul was right, then the question we have to ask is, do we want life and peace? It's possible that we don't. I, we have to remember that, that Jesus isn't going to drag us kicking and screaming into life and peace. You remember that when Jesus went to the pool, there was the guy by the pool who'd been there for years and years and years, and when the pool would get stirred, whoever got in first would get healed, which is just an odd story to begin with, right? And Jesus walks into the area of the pool, and he looks at this man, and he says to him, he asks this question, do you want to be healed? It's, it's not a rhetorical question. And the guy says, well, yeah, I do want to be healed, but every time the pool gets stirred, I'm, I can't get in there. Other people are quicker than me because I'm, 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 I'm crippled. I can't move fast enough. And so, but Jesus is asking, do you want to be healed? And so he, the implication is, yeah, I do. And so Jesus says, okay, then stand up and take your pallet and walk. Right? There was some work to be done here. But the first question is, do you want out of, do you want out of this? Do you want to be out of the situation you're in? Do you, and so our question is, it's not rhetorical, do we want life and peace? And what Paul says, if we want life and peace, then we have to keep our minds fixed on the things of the Spirit. And so for the purpose of our work this morning, I'm going to assume that you want to answer yes to both of those questions, that you do believe Paul's right about it, and secondly, that you want that. <clears throat> And so the place to begin is to recognize that keeping our minds rooted in the Spirit is work in which we take an active role. Okay, I've said multiple times to us over the last few weeks that transformation is a passive process, but we get to be active in that we get to bring ourselves into this place where the Spirit can do the work. I want to turn our attention to Colossians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. You can turn there if you have your Bibles. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Sorry, Colossians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. I don't know if you've ever, if you ever have done any public speaking with a Bible, but when you, when, you say the wrong, when you say the wrong scripture and then you turn there and you look at it like as hard as you possibly can because you, you, you know that you just said this scripture, but it's not there. And you read through it three or four times while people stare at you. It's very complicated. So it is Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Yeah, I, 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 I yes. Which I, I did that on purpose to prove to you that I'm not infallible. You should check. You should check absolutely everything I say. <laughs> no question about it. Let me see. Yeah. It's Colossians 3. Have I said that enough times? Verses 1 through 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. If then you've been raised up with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above and not on things of the earth, for you've died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. There are definitely times when the Greek language is helpful. I don't find it always helpful. I don't spend a lot of time, and I don't quote a lot of Greek language to you. I especially don't quote it when Charles is in the room because she always rolls her eyes when I do this. <laughs> She's like, don't show off. I'm like, okay, I get it. But, uh, <laughs> but sometimes it's really helpful, and here it's helpful. Paul says two things. For seek the things that are above and set your mind on things above. Now, we find this phrase in the present active imperative, and this is simply what it means. This is action that you keep doing, and you must do it. It's imperative. This is command, and it's present active. You, it's something you keep doing. It's not something you do once, and it's, it's done, right? So if we were going to translate this probably the most correctly, it would be keep seeking or keep setting your mind. 
Keep on doing this. It's, it's a process to which you return and you return and you return. In fact, if you have the New American Standard Bible translation, that's how they translate it. Keep on seeking the things that are above. Keep on setting your mind on the things that are above. Dallas Willard wrote this, The first and most basic thing we can do, we can do and must do is to keep God before our minds. This is the fundamental secret of caring for our souls. Our part in practicing the presence of God is to direct and redirect our minds constantly to Him. Soon, our minds will return to God as the needle of a compass constantly returns to the north. If God is the great longing of our souls, He will become the pole star of our inward beings. That's profound. The first and most basic thing we can do and must do is to keep God before our minds. And, and if we continue to come back, if we, if we keep seeking the things above, if we keep setting our mind on the things that are above, then we will habitually come to the place where, where we will return to that and return to that as the compass of, of the needle returns to north. One of the interesting things to note in Colossians chapter 3 is that Paul gives voice to this reality. We are in the world, but we're not supposed to be of the world. Okay, that, that's just the reality. We are in this world, but we're not supposed to be of the world, of the earth. And so the potential is to give ourselves to the things of the earth because we're here. And because the things of the earth are going to be like a magnet, they're going to pull us back and back and back to them. That's the nature of living in the world, of living on the earth, that we're going to be drawn back to the things that are of the earth because they're right in front of us. In the book Resilience, John Eldridge gives a couple of practical ideas that, that I think are, are just really are helpful and a helpful practice that helps us to set our minds on the things of the Spirit. First, this practical idea. We're amphibians. Unlike a frog that can live in water or on land and needs both, we can live in this world and not be of this world. So we can be of another world, right? We, we told that in Scripture. You're not citizens of earth. You're citizens of another world. You're strangers and aliens, but you're living in this world. So we live in the world, but we're not of the world. Our lives are rooted in another world. And Jesus sees this clearly, and he, and he reminds us in the Sermon on the Mount not to give our attention to the things of the earth, right? He says, don't worry about what we're eating or what we're wearing or what we're drinking or how long we're going to live here. Don't let those things, that's the stuff of earth. You know, what am I going to wear? What am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? How long am I going to live? Because you can't, you can't add to your life by worrying about it. So seek first the kingdom of heaven. He's just telling us, keep seeking the things above. Keep thinking about the things that are above. So the challenge is to be in the world and yet to not, to not be of the world. Now remember, we're talking about living a vibrant, winsome, and non-anxious presence in this troubled world. The hope is that we'll be a light here. Not that we'll be pulled out of it, but that we'll be a light here. Remember, we want to live, we want to, we want to draw people to Christ by showing them a light that is so lovely that they want with all their hearts to know the source of it. Like Jesus said something similar to this, didn't he? He said, you're, light, you're the light of the world. Let your light shine in such a way that men and women will see your good works and glorify God. He's saying, live and, and, and let a light shine from you that's so lovely that everyone around you wants to know the source of it. A quote by Madeline Lingle in Walking on Water, Reflections on Faith and Art. And Jesus also praised this for the disciples in his prayer in John chapter 17, specifically in verses 14 and 15. Remember, he says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. You know what I've noticed as I'm getting older? I don't think I'm, I mean, who knows? We don't know how long. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know how long I'm going to live. could live for a long time. I could live for a little time. I don't know. I just don't know. But here's what I've noticed as, as I've gotten older. Death doesn't seem as odd to me as it used to. You notice that when you get older? 
For one thing, a lot of the people, I know a lot of people who are my friends who have died. I was just thinking this morning as I was looking out here at how many people have passed away in the last few years just from this church. And you start, you know, there is a point where you go, you know, up a little bit. It's like the end of the day. <laughs> I've had dinner and I'm kind of ready for bed. And it's, it, I don't think it's hard to, if, if we really are leaning into the kingdom, to come to the place where, you know, life is just, this life is burdensome. There's a lot of pain in the world. That pain weighs on us when we see so much of it. And it could be easy to go, and we probably said this, yeah, I'm ready to go. I, I'm happy to, you know, I'm ready to go. But Jesus didn't pull us out. He didn't give us that. <laughs> he didn't know, you stay here as long as you, you're here. The choice is not yours, really. I mean, some people make that choice, but the vision is not to escape from the world, but the vision is to be a light in the world that's so lovely that the people around us want to have it. And so that's a, that, that, that practical idea that we're amphibians. We live in this world, but we're not of this world. We live with our one foot in two worlds. John Stott wrote a book years ago called Between Two Worlds, and it's written to preachers. And he said that preachers have to live with one foot in the biblical world and one foot in the world that we live in. That's, and we, we, we need to recognize that we live in this world, but we're not of this world. And then the practical idea, the practical tool that we get is to keep seeking the things above. Willard says that our part of practicing the presence of God is to direct and redirect our minds constantly to Him. Now, the practical tool that Eldridge gives is the idea of consecrating our minds to God. And I'm gonna, I want to do this with you for just a, a couple of minutes. So to consecrate something in biblical terms is to set it apart for a specific purpose, right? To set it apart for a specific purpose. I have, I have this guitar I play. I've been, it's the only guitar almost I've played in this church for well, going on 26 years. But I do play at other places, occasionally. But I could say, no, this guitar, I only play it in church, and I only play worship music on it. I could say that. I'm not going to say that. But, but if I were to say that, I could say, I'm consecrating this only to worship, only to this church. I'm setting it aside or apart for only this purpose. And what we can do is we can set our minds, we can consecrate our minds, we can set them apart for a specific purpose. I have found this part of Eldridge's book, teaching in the book Resilience really super helpful because it's so specific. Here's how he teaches it. I'm going to ask you to do something in just a moment, but here's how he teaches it. We consecrate our minds to the Holy Spirit. And this, speak this out loud, okay? Not right now, just let me read it through first. Holy Spirit, I consecrate my mind to you. Lord, all of my mental life. And this is what I found so helpful when I first heard it. I give you my thoughts, my focus, and my attention. This is the part that was really helpful to me. I give you my memory and recall, my understanding and imagination. Now, that was really helpful to me because I think, I think there are things that I have in my recall, my memory, that I wish weren't there. Now, here's what I found. It doesn't work quickly because those things that I want to have removed haven't been yet. But just to pay attention to that, right? I give you my memory and my recall and then my understanding and my imagination. You know, we're, we're quick in this, in this world, in this enlightenment world we live in to give our intellect to God. But have you given your imagination to God? Have you brought your imagination into the service of your faith and your theology? I consecrate to you, Lord, my interpretation of events in my life. That's a big one. My interpretation of the events in my life. I consecrate those to you. I dedicate the life of my mind to you, Lord God, and to you alone. Okay, here's what I want you to do. We're going to take a couple minutes for this. In your the pocket of your seat there is there should be a three by five card. I want to ask you to take that out physically. Just pull that out. Um, and then there should be a pencil there. And, and here's what I'd like you to do. I'll give you a couple minutes to do this. Um, I want you to write out on that card this prayer. Just write it out as you see it there. Or you could write it in your sermon notes, but I'd rather, I'd rather you write it on the 3x5 the card. You can find it, all right? So, 
If you're watching on our live stream, I invite you to grab a piece of paper and just write this out. There's a slide on your screen there. So just take, just take a minute to write it out. We won't be in a hurry. I won't get nervous about it, you know, being about nothing happening in here for the next couple of minutes. So you can re- relax too. But, but pull the card out and, and, and write this prayer out. And let's do this. It, when you get it written out, just, just hold, it, hold up your hand with it, just so I can see kind of, I don't know how long this will take. I write this out in my journal fairly routinely, but I don't know how long it takes. So when, you're, when you get done with it, just hold up your card, and then I'll know we're getting kind of close. there. How many of you have it written out? Yeah, a few, a few of you. Okay, I'm going to give you just a, another minute or so. If I was an impatient person, I would say, write faster. But I'm not going to be impatient. Okay. I see that hand. I always want to say that in church. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. 30 more seconds. Okay, go ahead and keep writing if you don't have it all written down. But let me just remind you of something. And I'm not a a teacher, like I'm not a trained professional teacher. But here's what I do know about teaching. First of all, repetition really matters. Like you, you will learn what you repeat over and over and over again. You just will. You don't have to work, you know, like the songs that you love, you sing to them without having the lyrics printed in front of you because they're the songs you love and you play them over and over and over. Another thing that I know about teaching is that it's more successful when we incorporate more senses in the teaching, right? It's one thing to hear it, but what if you can see it? What if you can say it? What if you can write it? I write in my journal consistently because when I see what I'm writing and I'm reading it while I'm writing it and I'm thinking about it and then I often speak it out loud, see, I'm involving a whole lot more senses in the process. And when you involve the senses in the process, it, it roots it deeper in your life. So here's what I want us to do now. Wherever you are in writing this out, if you didn't get it all down, we can send it to you by email or something. Just ask for it on your journey card. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to read it with me from your page. I want you to read it with me 
from your page, as much of it as you have written out at this moment. And I'll, I'll read it kind of slowly. Here we go. Let's begin. Holy Spirit, I consecrate my mind to you. Lord, all of my mental life, I give you my thoughts, my focus, and attention. I give you my memory and recall, my understanding and imagination. I consecrate to you, Lord, my interpretation of events in my life. I dedicate the life of my mind to you, Lord God, and to you alone. Now hang on to that card and use that prayer of consecration. As I said, I I routinely now in my morning devotional time, as I write that in my journal, I'll write specific parts of it in my journal, and sometimes I'll write down a little bit more in between those lines. But we recognize that dedicating the life of our mind to God, consecrating our minds to God, is a process we have an active role to play in, right? We we get to be a part of that. It's about stopping and returning our attention to the things that are above and rather than the things that are on earth. Now, I think it would be really helpful for us if we would do this routinely through the day. Maybe whenever you notice yourself paying attention to the things of earth in a way that distracts you from things of the kingdom, And so we just recognize that keeping our minds rooted in the Spirit requires setting aside what seizes our attention or worries us. We've been working in this little acrostic, REST, R-E-S-T. And before, never mind, (laughs) I was going to give you a test, but I decided, uh, Tamara decided I wasn't going to give you a test. She was worried about not passing the test, I think. But anyway. What, what, is, what is rest? I've added a little bit to this. Some, some, some of what I've just added to this a little bit has to do with our reflections as a staff. Routinely, st- Phil leads our staff meetings routinely, and routinely he's been asking us as a staff to, to say these out loud. He doesn't give us the answers. I was really nervous the first time because I thought, man, I hope I know him because I came up with him, right? But I've added a little bit. But what is this? How do, we, how do we work through this little acrostic? How do we set our minds on things above? Well, part of that is releasing things that are here. And so the, the R is to relax and reflect, right? Let's just get quiet for him and let's pay attention to, let's notice what we're paying attention to. What's bothering me lately? What's causing anxiety, worry, or stress? We can write those things out. Then the second part of this is the E, to evaluate and examine. Melissa said examine like a, a couple weeks ago when we were doing the test, right? And she got the test wrong. Let's evaluate. But she said examine. But you know what I, th- I thought? That's a really, I think that's a better word. It's actually evaluate and examine. So, okay, what are the things that are going on in my life? What are those things? I'm going to start to evaluate. I'm going to stew on those things just a little bit, right? I want to consider whether or not I can do anything about what's bothering me. Is it inside of my control or is it outside of my control? It's really helpful to do this. Write out the things that are worrisome to you, that are bothering you, that are creating stress in you, and then just ask that question. Do I have control over this or not? And then the S I've expanded a little bit. Set it right. If there's something that's going on in you that you can fix, fix it. Don't let it be an issue. Don't let it continue to hang over you like, like you know, just this, just this problem that keeps hanging over you. You, you know what I'm talking about, right? There's, maybe it's a task that you need to get done. Maybe it's a conversation you really need to have. Maybe you feel like you've offended somebody and they're in your back you, you think, I really need to have this conversation. I actually got a letter this week from someone that I had a bit of conflict with a few years back and it was the letter. I was really surprised to see it in the mail. And the letter started this way. I, I know that I should have talked with you about this years ago, but I haven't, but now I want to. And I was I'm so grateful. I'm really grateful to have gotten the letter. But I also know what that's like, that to, to send that letter is, is to take that off your plate, right? If you don't take it off your plate, it just stays there. And it just, turn, it just churns in you. If there's something you can do uh, and that situation's not solved yet, but it, it will be, I hope. But if there's something you can do, set it right. Get on with it. Don't, don't wait. And if it's not something you can do anything about, set it aside. If it's within my control to deal with it, I need to make a plan to set it right. And if it's outside of my control, then I need to set it aside. Because I can't control it. <laughs> It doesn't matter if I want to hang on to it. And, and I find that in this process, i got to routinely let go of those things because I want to take them back. I want to grab them back. 
But then we trust God with it, right? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. We, we set those things on Him, and then we trust Him. But if we can go a little bit further with this idea, we recognize that we really have to pay attention to what we're paying attention to and bring it to the light of truth. Like Jesus said, the, and when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Can I suggest to you that's not a religious platitude, but it's true about everything. The truth about things will set you free. It may not give you the information you want, but it will set you free. You know, if you have a medical diagnosis that's not the one you wanted, but at least tells you what's going on with you, there's some freedom in that. There's some relief in it. Now I know where to go. Now I know what to do. You might not like the information, but it's helpful. It's good to be truthful. When you know the truth about a thing, the truth can set you free. And it may set you free to say, God, I can't manage this. I need to put this on you. But we have to pay attention to what's pulling us along. One of the ways that that, that, that we can do that is to catch hold of and to hang on to what's getting our attention. And so let me just ask you the question, what are the false narratives or the untruths that you're hanging on to? Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, for we, we walk in the flesh, we, though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. What are they? We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, to the obedience of Christ. And so we're talking about, again, setting our minds on things that are above. So when you believe a false narrative, that drives you. You live according to your narrative. And if you're believing a false narrative, that narrative is going to take you to places that are not going to be true. And so Paul says, we destroy strongholds in this battle, destroying arguments and that which is not according to God. And we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And so what are the lies that you believe? You know, Satan's tool, Satan's only power is to lie to us. Satan's greatest tool is to distract us with these lies. So what are the stories that you tell yourself? What are the stories that you're living? What are the narratives you're living in? What are the truths that we can hold on to? What's the story God's telling so let's just think about it this way. Let me give you a, a real simple example. Here's a lie. If I can just get that one more thing I really want, the slightly better thing, the slightly shinier thing, then I'll be content. That's a lie. Because you know it's a lie, don't you? Because you've got the slightly better thing, the shinier thing. And, and it, it did soothe you for a bit, but then it stopped. And then you wanted the next shiny thing, right? That's just the way the world works. And here's the truth. God has made us for himself and our hearts will be restless until they find their rest in him. So when you find yourself going, oh, I just wish I could, if I could just get that one thing, if I could get that position, if I could get that house, if I could get that car, if I could get just a little bit more money, then, then I would really be able to be content. In that moment, when you attend to yourself and you find yourself thinking that, you say, I know that's a lie. It's not that getting the shinier thing is a wrong thing necessarily. Go ahead, if that's what you want. But just recognize that won't be what gives you contentment. Because there's nothing in the world that will fill the space that only God can fill. And so the truth is, as Paul said, I've learned to be content in all things. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If I don't have as much, I'm content. If I have a lot, I'm content. If I have the right clothes, I'm content. If I'm naked, I'm content. I mean, that's literally what he says. He's saying, I have to find this truth to be at work in my body in order to be content. And so we rehearse the truth in the midst of the lie. We return to and return to and return to the truth. And these aren't mind games. It's right. I think sometimes when we talk this way, someone's like, oh, you're just playing a mind game. No, we're not playing a mind game. We're actually replacing truth. We're replacing lie with truth because you can't just get rid of the lie. Nature abhors a vacuum. Something will fill that space. And so what we have to fill the lie with is the truth. That's what Paul is telling us in 2 Corinthians. This is how we seek the things above. We bring these lies, these false narratives, and we replace them with true. And so it's equally important to recognize that having our minds rooted in the Spirit requires paying attention to what we're paying attention to. And so how are you, as you go through your day, being careful about what you are paying attention to? 
What are the inputs that, you're shape, that are shaping your view of the world? Now just do some reflection on this. What are the inputs that are shaping your view of the world? Are you living day in and day out by a political narrative that says if we get the right people in power, life will be better? I'm not saying life wouldn't be better if some people were in power versus other people. We know that. I mean, we can see. But, but would, life get, would it all be solved? Like if we're living a political narrative... That's what we think. Well, if we could just get the right people in power, then everything would get fixed. Or maybe you're living in an economic narrative. If, this, if, this, if we could just get out of this recession, if, if inflation would just... De- then I would really be happy. That's the, that's the economic narrative, right? What is the narrative that's driving the way you live and driving the way you feel? If we're going to be rooted in things above, then we need to root our minds in things above more than anything else. So think about the the directive and and the wisdom from Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Look, it's day and night, day and night. It's just morning and evening. We're meditating on this law. The text says, he's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf doesn't wither and and all that 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 person does, they prosper. Do you want to to live a vibrant, winsome and non-anxious presence in the world? Do you want to be a tree that bears fruit no matter what's going on around you? You've got to be planted in in a stream that's not going to dry up. The streams of the earth are going to dry up always. It takes a little time, takes a lot of time, but they're going to dry up. To be rooted in the things of the kingdom is to be rooted in the things of God. And the wicked are like chaff, they're, they're, the wind drives them away. If we want to live vibrant, winsome, and non anxious lives in this troubled world, we're going to need to be like that tree that's roots go down into living water and it yields its fruit in its season. Remember that Paul reminds us to fix our minds on the good and the true and the beautiful in Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. This is what we pay attention to. What's good, what's true, what's beautiful. Paul isn't so much giving us information as he's giving us a practice. So here's what we're going to do. Flip your card over. And I know this is going to take just another minute, but I want you to flip the card over on the back side of that card. I want you to write Philippians 4, 8. It'll be on the screen there. Write that out on your card. Write it out on your sermon notes. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Write that on your card. When someone gets that written out, just hold up your card. Once you have it written out, just take another minute to do that. Finally, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And truly, if you'd write slowly and you don't get this written out, we'll just ask on your join the journey card and I was going to say we will send it to you. And what I mean by we will send it to you is that Dana <laughs> will send it to you.
Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Might be interesting to go and do a, a little, just, just get a dictionary. Just grab the Merriam-Webster. You don't need a Greek dictionary. Just grab the Merriam-Webster and or look it up online. You can find it online and, 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 and define each of these words. What is, what is, what is something that's true? What, what is that? Truth, I mean, Dallas Willis, the truth is understanding things as they are in reality. That's what a true thing is. What's an honorable thing? What's a just thing? What, what, what's pure mean? What does lovely mean? What's commendable mean? Okay. So let's, let's do this now again. Let's read this together. Whatever you have written out, whatever you have written out, let's read it um, out loud together. Read it from your card. I know it's up on the screen, but read it from your card if you have it on your card. Ready to go? Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And so as thoughts come to your mind as you're living out this week and something comes to your mind, you, you might just ask yourself that question. Is this lovely thought? Is it commendable? Is it true? Is it good? Is it excellent? Take that card with you. Maybe put it on the dash of your card. Maybe put it on your mirror in the bathroom. Wherever you're going to see it and and, and, and hopefully where you can actually pick it up and, and read it, either side. Like, I consecrate my mind to you, all of it. Or whatever is good and true and lovely and pure and all these things, this is what I want to think on as I go in, into this next week. And so here's some questions for reflection. What, what is your practice of setting your mind on the things of the Spirit? What, what are you doing intentionally as you go through the week to get your mind off the things of the world, to get out of the world narrative and get into a narrative of truth that brings life and peace. What are, what are you doing intentionally? And then number two, what's capturing your attention? What's got you really wrapped up right now? Maybe what are the lies you're believing and what truths dispel those lies? You actually go find them and search them out. What are the truth that dispels the lie that you're living in and believing? That's a practical, intentional process. You could, it's just problem solving. Right? If, you, if you run into a problem, you stop and you go, ah, this is a problem. How am I going to fix the problem? Well, I'm going to set the things right that are, that are wrong. That's how you solve problems. But Paul says, this is how we fight this battle in, the spirit, in, the, in this world. It's not, against, not like the weapons of this world, but we're going to take every thought captive and then we're going to examine that and bring it under the obedience to the narrative of truth. That's how we fight this battle. That's how we seek the things above. And now, I want to give you a project for the week, and then we'll be done. The prayer of intention. I got this from Elizabeth Payne a few years ago. Um, but I'm going to invite you, I want to challenge you three times a day this week. I know that's a lot. Now, there's a really fancy thing that you have in your pocket. You weren't aware of it, but I'm going to make you aware of it right now. I don't have it in my pocket, because if I have it in my pocket, it will go off. My iPad will do it too, though, but my f your phone. You can actually, I've heard people say this recently, well, you know, we don't live in a monastery. That's true, but that doesn't mean you can't. You can turn your life into a monastery by taking your phone and setting three really awesome bells a day. You could do chimes. You could actually be like you're in a monastery. And when the chime goes off, here's what happens in the monastery. When the bell goes off, when the chimes go off, you stop what you're doing at that moment in time. If you're hoeing beets because you're part of a farmer at the monastery, when the bell goes off, you set your hoe down. That's not where the word hoe down comes from, I don't think, but <laughs> you, set, you set your hoe down and you go to prayer. If you're writing, you stop in the middle of a sentence. You don't finish the sentence and you go to prayer. If you happen to be working in the brewery, well, then you keep brewing because there are some things too important. No. No. If you're working in a brewery, you, you stop your work. This is what you do when the bells go off. So I'm going to invite you to do this prayer of intention. You can do it in 15 minutes and try to do it this week three times a day. Commit yourself to do it once a day at least, maybe morning, and maybe you could pull in a midtime and maybe an evening, 
okay? It's, it's not long. You've got it on the back side of your sermon notes. So if you didn't get a sermon notes page and you want to do this, grab it. It was too long to put on a slide, so I didn't put it on a slide, but here it is. The first part, prayer of presenting oneself as a sacrifice from Romans 12. It's the spiritual discipline of daily presenting oneself to God as living sacrifice, open to Him and His will in all things. Prayer of intention. Lord, I am here. I'm present. My, I present myself and my will to you as my act of worship. Here I am. This wakes me up daily to recognize the person of God and His independent will for us. Number two, in receptivity to the Spirit, hear the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12 Again, this part will take three minutes. You, could, you, just, you just ruminate on this. Lord, I am listening. What words from Scripture, what wisdom has your Spirit been bringing to my attention lately that I might respond to them? What am I hearing? What, what's been coming to my attention? This keeps me listening for how the Spirit may be calling me through the word of wisdom. The third part, prayer of recollection. Philippians 3, 7 through 9. The spiritual discipline of reminding the self of its true identity in Christ. Full pardon, full acceptance, and Christ in me that I'm not alone. Paul says that's the mystery. Christ in me is the hope of glory. And so the prayer of intention. God, whatever I do today, I want to do this in you. I don't want to do this alone in my own power or as a way to hide and cover. I don't want to find my identity in anything but Christ. I am in Christ. I am the beloved, and that is my true identity. We can have idolatry to self, right? Seeking my salvation in, in some role or identity that I choose. So this, is, this protects me from over-attaching to identities and roles of my own goodness or making decisions from guilt and shame and some effort to, to atone for myself rather than re re-realizing daily Christ's atonement and forgiveness. This is coming back, right? This is the invitation part of abide. I'm inviting Jesus to come along. And then prayer of honesty, the fourth part, the spiritual discipline whereby we open to God and ourselves in what is truly going on in our heart in order to be truth-telling to take place in our relationships and in life in general. We don't always tell ourselves the truth, but this is a prayer of honesty. The prayer of intention here, Lord, what is going on in my heart right now with you, with others, with my life, my situations? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Open my heart to you today in truth, lest I deceive myself. Keep me from, or let me confess, any idolatry. Now this protects us from superficial obedience, from arrogance, closed-heartedness, dullness of heart. It opens the truth of myself to the truth of God and His loving work in my life. And then finally, the prayer of discernment, the spiritual discipline whereby we learn to watch what the Spirit is doing in us, not merely our work, to consider the work of God, what His will is in all things versus our, ours so the devil, uh, or the devil so that we can better cooperate with the Spirit. Here we seek wisdom on how to respond to His work that's ongoing within us. The prayer of intention, Lord, what are you doing and what is it that you want me to become and do if I am to do your will? And so here we learn to wait on God. I want to challenge you to, to make this a project this week. And yeah. Take as much time, as little time as you, as you can get to keep seeking the things above, to keep seeking the things of God, to set our mind on the Spirit is a process that will take monotony. And we don't like monotony, but that's where learning, that's where transformation happens. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for meeting us here in this place, and we thank you for the work that you do in and among us. Turn our attention to you. Remind us again that you, you are good and true and beautiful, and your narrative and your words are good and true and beautiful. Help us to turn our, our attention to you intentionally as we go into and through this coming week so that our lives might be vibrant, winsome, and non-anxious presence to the people around us, that we might live a life and a light so lovely that everyone around us wants more than anything else to know the source of it, to know you. And it's in your name that we come, Jesus. Amen. Amen.